So um, whilst we wait for some questions to come through, we've got some general questions to come through. Uh, I have one question for Clive to start with, uh, and then we'll open the floor up to some sort of wider questions, if that's okay. So Clive, um, there was one question around, you, you talked about, and it's a really interesting point, you talked about how uh, GIS could really help and it, it could facilitate the interoperability between different data sets and you mentioned those four different types of applications and data associated to them, talking about CAD, EDMS, GIS and AIMS. Could you, could you elaborate a bit more on that, you know, the, the way that GIS can help integrate those various different data sources? Uh, sure, not, no, no, no problem. Um, in terms of what I was setting up there was uh, uh, there's, there's the, the, the key element about kind of using location as that framework to really kind of bring information together. So I think some of the scenes that we saw earlier with the 3D model and the graphics, uh, putting that within the context of actually the environment, uh, trying to understand that local context is really, really powerful uh, to understanding um, the digital twin. Um, uh, just to reiterate some of that uh, in, in terms of our physical assets, uh, assets, they will exist somewhere. A station will exist somewhere. The track will be positioned somewhere. Uh, the overhead continuity system will be linked. So there's a lot of um, uh, location questions, um, both during design and construction, but also in terms of operations and maintenance, trying to understand uh, where there might be failures or which tracks need uh, repairing uh, based on the performance reading back from sensors. Uh, there's a whole host of remote sense data that uh, um, I think one of the other speakers touched on in terms of bringing together the wealth of information uh, that we actually have available to ourselves. Um, and I think there's more and more data coming on board as more technologies um, uh, you know, uh, come onto the scene. Uh, so it's a very exciting time in terms of actually uh, that digital engineering space to take advantage of things. Um, I think the challenge is actually uh, trying to pick the right ones and picking the, the ones that have the most uh, most effect. Um, I, I did want to um, kind of elaborate on the last bit about interoperability. Um, and as my experience of over 20 years in the GIS industry, um, I saw it very much kind of a, a while back where I was creating the data and we spent a lot of time actually making data, preparing data, um, making sure that it was interoperable. Uh, whereas now I'm sure those on the call and uh, those on the panel will probably recognize that actually dragging and dropping uh, something like a web service and reading and streaming di data directly uh, um, is a, a massive efficiency save. So yes, I did grow up in the days where I was creating networks on Unix machines, um, but now you can just pull that in and you can do root analysis on things like Google Maps and various other software. Uh, so that's the that's the shift. Um, and as we go into the space, it's trying to learn from that and the, the, the techniques and the, uh, the process we went through uh, to develop those standards that really help with the efficiency uh, side of things. But actually, you should be focusing on using the data rather than making the data, if that makes any sense. It, it does. Thank you for that. And then, you, know, you were touching on breaking down silos there, bringing that sort of, and the, the evolution of, and the, the ease of it, data integration, and maybe also the automation of data integration. I, I suppose one question we've had is where, where do you see the role of GIS and BIM data integration? So, you know, two of those applications. Where do you see that data integration in, in the journey towards creating digital twins? And, and again, digital twins is something that several of the speakers have mentioned today. So, I mean, I'll open that question up to the floor. Does anybody want to? Make the first step. And really, the question is where do you see the role of GIS and BIM data integration in the journey towards creating digital twins for transportation assets? Any takers? <laughs> okay. The, 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 the easiest way, kind of, it's uh, I've managed to understand it is, uh, and it's a bit because I'm a bit of a petrol head, and I like watching Formula One. Um, but effectively, if you if you're watching Formula One, everybody's looking at a bunch of screens. They're looking at the telemetry. They know the the condition of the track. They know the temperature of the track. Uh, there's a lot of digital data being fed in, 
And if you take that same example, and in terms of the, the high speed two railway that we that we're constructing at the moment, it would be very much the same sort of approach. And actually having that digital version where we can actually virtually test it without actually running a car on track <laughs> in the Formula One example. So it's very much trying to interact with that from an operations and maintenance point of view. However, we can then expose elements of that as well to our customers. So it would be very much things like trying to understand where you are in terms of the platform and uh, where the carriages are that empty and you can get a seat and these sorts of things. So uh, the, uh, the, the, there's a lot in terms of that location element. I I do consider that the, the GIS and the BIM fields are coming closer together. I actually think that this, uh, the, the difference between the two of them are becoming lesser and lesser over time. Uh, people are just concerned about using the digital twin um, and they're not so much focused on the formats, but I suspect for ourselves, uh, we, we, we do need to do that. But for the end user, um, it's about operating and maintaining that that asset and for customers engaging with it uh, appropriately. Yeah, so, so would you say key to that is, is going to be data quality? So less around the data format, but more around the quality of the data that you can derive that and verify those that planned design stages or, or derive that kind of real time operational information from. Yes, it's that as well as the data mobility. Yeah, okay. To be able to move that data around quickly and get the insights that you need at the time. Okay. And, and, well, and that to, ties to D Dave, that ties partly down to you, partly your presentation. You would talk, you know, you know, the idea of data as a service and the way you were looking to, you know, in, in little bits, automate data flows throughout the supply chain it really ties into that idea of bringing automatically bringing data together and checking the quality and, and automatically integrating it i mean what, what experiences have you had in terms of bringing gis and cad data together for sort of digital twin purposes well that uh they're fundamental because uh you're making sure departments can can share information between them i, I just want to touch on one point actually that um that rob made this morning which i thought was really interesting the um the sort of um using this uh using clive's analogy of the automotive uh, uh approach uh rob was talking about the the automation uh, automotive um, manufacturing and and producing off-site uh components um and the digital twin can clearly have a, an impact on cost savings for the future. Um, I'd cite an example. I saw uh, an engineering firm uh, taking uh, a fabricated bridge and running a 3D model of moving that fabricated bridge from the side of the road into position. And for them, it was all about making sure could they actually turn the bridge and get it into position once it had been fabricated. So, you know, that that is something you don't, the logistics, you don't think about moving this huge construction a handful of meters but actually physically getting it um getting the arc of the um uh, of the structure around uh it was a real benefit of having good data quality good um appropriately constructed data that share is shared between um the different teams and ultimately it, it's in a format and a structure that it can just be displayed in whatever 3D package happens to be around at the time. So I think that was, that was a, a, a really important point that uh, that Rob made. So it was, it was nice to nice to hear that that's that's in place. Thank you for that, Dave. I, I mean, I think you touched on another question that's just come up. You talked about whichever 3D package is there. So it's almost a you know, the data is key, and in some respects, the the, the applications can be agnostic, and the use of those it doesn't really matter i mean well of, of that which what does one question is what does fit for purpose data mean and how can tools systems and applications support this sort of fit for data fit for purpose data aspiration fit for purpose that, means different things to different people doesn't it Perfect. Yes. And can you can you elaborate, Chris? Well, you know, you know um, people who are working on roads are more interested in the road than they are where the houses are, and, and vice versa. If, if you're if you're planning to put a route, say through a through a field um, as part of HS2, you need to understand the width of the field. You're not really interested in things 
about things further away um, but you're interested in the here and now and what's what's around you so fit for purpose is very means very different things to to many different people and, it, and it's about getting the data quality that's fit for purpose for that arena it, you know in some cases that data being at 80 percent um fit for purpose might be adequate in other cases it might need to be 100 percent. in other cases it might be less but certainly uh, when i've been working uh, working around the data quality side of things um and, and, and usually something like geocortex to bring all the data together you you begin to understand that people's people's own idea of fit for purposeness is very very different across different groups of people if you're trying to bring different data Okay. And I think that, that bridge example is a really good one, isn't it? Because if you're looking at modeling that bridge in terms of a, putting it in place, you, you're only looking at the, the accuracy of the sort of overall size of the, of, of the bridge. But if you're looking at then loading that with, with, with additional loads, then that's a, a completely different set of data that needs to be, needs to be accurate. And I think that the, the, the problem is going to be with, with these digital twins is what, what, can, you, what can you rely on? What, what, is, what, is, what, is the, what is the accuracy to, to what you're trying to test? Is, is what you're, you're modeling on that going to work in the, in the way you, you expect it to? And how real is that application? And, uh, and very, very, very interestingly, the bridge, the bridge thing is, is quite apt, right? Very close to one spacious office in Cambridge. You've got the A14. Um, and a few years back, uh, they, they decided to grow, build a, a cycle bridge across the A14 from Milton to the science park or the business park. Um, all the notices went out six months in advance that the A14 was going to be closed. Uh, they built the bridge alongside the A14. They built the stanchions to to put the bridge onto the stanchions. When they wheeled it in place, they were a meter short. But they had to wheel it all the way back again and go through the same exercise. So the whole the whole idea of having a digital twin and actually getting it right um, would, would have saved lots and lots of money then. But again, that it also means that the data's got to be right. The information that you're feeding into the digital twin has got to be right. To get it right but then then the a14 connection to the a a1 was a success of testing and digital twin because that was one where they were going to shut the a1 for a, for a weekend and they did it in in 24 hours or whatever the numbers were yeah, that was, yeah. 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 and that just shows that the the rate of change in i remember when that cycle bridge went up it was, was it 10 years ago 12 years ago something like that so the rate of change in that time has been quite dramatic mm. uh, Thank you. Another question that's come through is, um, well, it goes back to innovation really. So we've, and this goes back to Rob's initial presentation, there's, there's discussion and various different types of innovation have been highlighted. Some of those have been sort of groundbreaking radical uses and new technology, but some of them have been incremental changes to process. And as Rob mentioned, there's this almost that line of sand is enough, that incremental innovation is enough to kind of chip away at the challenges. Uh, what I suppose what what do you see this is to the panel what do you see is the, the next big major or radical innovation that's on the horizon that's really going to impact uh, infrastructure build and and, and and maintenance supply chains the, the biggest thing I mean you touched on it really nicely there and the, the biggest thing that we're seeing is um, the amount of new data that is being collected by the advancements in technology and we've really seen that we've got some great examples where technology was tried 20 years ago on some of the huge tunnel boring machines um, and it failed because the technology accuracy wasn't quite there well now we've moved on the technology is advanced and we believe that we can deliver a world first on some of our tunnel boring machines to allow the continuous boring of, of machinery um, but then I look at some of the the smaller pieces of work that are again industry changing. Um, occupational deafness is one of the the biggest is the biggest occupational health risk to engineering uh, engineering workforce by threefold. Um, so we, we've we've run on a project to look at active ear defence as opposed to passive ear defence, which is traditionally buds and ears. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, they built a model that captures noise that allows you to visually understand the performance of noise on a site. That's something that's never been done before. That's never been captured. 
So visually being able to see what, what the noise levels are on your site allow you to model the site setup and the safety precautions that need to be associated to the behaviors that happen on that site. And that's really revolutionary. And that's really taking a step change in how we can protect the workforce using advancements in digital tech and building them into a visual model that make it really relatable. I, I, I hate the term digital twin because I think people really struggle to, to get their heads around what that is still. Um, you know, we're talking to lots of engineers that have been working for lots of many years and really struggle with the concept, but actually just being able to show them a map of a site that shows them uh, the noise performance or uh, some of the AI technologies that are showing them a visual of, this is an actual picture, uh, this is your visu visual image of what is happening on site right now. And then just overlaying that of the plan design really brings it to life for them. Um, so an AI for me is one of the biggest things that we're gonna learn from that because the capture of technology, the automation, it's just freeing, it frees up so much time and resource for skilled workforce to do what they they want to do, not what they're paid to do, but what they want to do and, and how they can probably explore the greatest value of what they can deliver as opposed to just saving some time and an, an hour spent. Um, the ecology example is a great one of that. You know, by by running AI for ecology, we're, we're removing the need for ecologists to have to crawl over um, some of our, uh, our sites on their hands and knees, and instead it's just telling them of where the pinch points need to be. And some really interesting examples there, Rob. I mean, like the idea of you know, driving automation, driving AI, driving business rules into, into those more menial tasks which enable uh, specialists and, and experts to get on with the sort of high value stuff and, and as a plug for next week we'll see a, an example of that within a, in an ecology field capture supply chain so please dial in for that um, but you also you also mentioned that kind of and this touches on to what Clive mentioned as well as using GIS as an integration framework but it's using a GIS as a visual integration framework for you know that health and safety, almost sustainability, not say touchy feely, but the slightly softer elements that we're really starting to see become more important in supply chain. So that's a, I mean, it takes a step on from the propagation of um, radio waves and from sort of you know three G and four G masts into something more health and safety, health and safety related. So that's, I think that's a really good use case. Um, just looking at time and some more questions coming through I mean, it's a really quick one that's come through i mean in terms of what you tackle first and again open to the open to the group would you tackle data quality or data integration first as an approach should i try and have a go at that one sure. <laughs> um uh, I think it kind of relates back to that 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 initial question about kind of what, what what's considered um, uh, good quality data. From 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 our view, um, data quality is one of those things you need to look at first. But you need to look at the assessment of that quality expectation for the purpose that it's going to be used and the decision you're going to be making on the back of that. Um, uh, so Chris rightly points out we actually don't need the detailed dimensions. You need just the broad is moving through um, so it very much depends on the question however data integration is probably where we are starting to pick up some of those um, uh, kind of more uh, uh, kind of human needed kind of interaction in terms of understanding the quality of data um, and that's when you that's when you start noticing well, actually the quality of my data is not good enough because it's not really for that purpose for that integration but I do feel the data quality does need to come first. Data integration highlights some of those issues. Um, but I, from our point of view, I think it's, it's quality uh, specifications and the expectations of the data quality that needs to be set first. Yeah, and that makes sense. And in fact, what you're describing is that kind of setting the, the expectations of data quality. But it's a sounds as if it, if correct me if I'm wrong, it's the iterative process. So as you start to delve into the use of your data, understanding how it is fit for purpose, it drives out potentially more issues, which then enables you to go back and reevaluate the data. And, and do you see it as an ongoing process, and are you experiencing that at the moment? There, 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 there are, um, and I'm kind of getting a little bit kind of academic about this. Some of this is about data quality, yeah. and some of it's about data precision. 
um, uh, rather than quality, uh, because you only need to be as precise as you need to be within a specific um, stage. So on the HS2 project, um, very early on, when we're actually just drawing a line on the map and we're trying to understand the environmental impacts, you don't need a lot of precision uh, to kind of just maybe look at a zone. Uh, but actually, as you go more into detailed design and construction and then operations maintenance, that level of precision and that quality increases and becomes more important uh, based on those decisions you're going to be making. And all those are rooted in the decisions you need to be making rather than necessarily, uh, you know, having an, a massively accurate um, uh, track alignment uh, very early on when you're just trying to assess uh, whether it's a viable uh, route. Make, so I think the two are very inter inter interrelated. It makes sense. Thank you. Mark, I'll, I'll throw in a, a quick point uh, because it, it also completely depends on when you're asking that um, question as in at what point in the project you're asking it. Because if you're asking it up front, then actually um, you can you can try to resolve some of the data quality challenges by making sure you capture it through tools that control that data capture. So that you, you're mandated to capture data in a particular structure that will be fit for purpose rather than having to tackle it by using data integration to connect to data after it's been created to go and um, fix it. Um, so the, there's there's a couple of areas where there, that could come into play, but um, but but certainly they're, they're fairly intrinsically linked with one another. That makes sense to you. So driving, almost driving data quality. From the drive from the, the word go. Yeah, into the point of capture. And, and then Clive, as you're saying, there's that difference between precision and quality. It's also a sort of it's sort of a learning curve, and it sort of carries on. They feed each other. I was I was quite surprised with some work that, that Highways England did. I was I hadn't really thought about this, but you know all the all the diggers on on Highways England when they're extending the motorway uh, have they they can't move the bucket into the line of the traffic. It's it, it, it's blocked because of GIS data and, and 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 the way that works. But you know that's that's the first stage of doing something in terms of a stopping something. But then as as we learn more then we get into the stage where you can you can have more autonomous vehicles to to do things on those so you know it's, it's a sort of keep stepping up process i think okay yeah that makes sense um i think we have a question that's come just come in we've got ryan williams from vertus is so this is is there anything in development to set in stone bim university courses not just masters or software engineering courses tailored to construction software implementation. So is there anything in development to set in stone BIM university courses or software engineering courses tailored to construction software implementation? Does anyone want to pick that up? Does that, do we, do we need a sort of, uh, qualification on that question do you need any more information on that uh, i'm not sure i'm qualified to answer but i'm uh, i think the the head of um geomatics at ucl next week is probably um the, the person to uh, to nail that one down i think that's a good call dave so ryan we'll 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 park that and then present that to um jonathan next week um so conscious of time i there is one more question, which is which is kind of burning a hole in in front of me. Um, it, again, this is open to the group, and it's a, it's a it's looking at one of the other questions from a slightly different angle. But which major transportation asset challenges do you see geospatial tools, systems, and applications being a major contributor towards solving in the coming decade? So, which major challenges do you see as tools, application systems being a major yeah, being a major help to solving in the next decade. And I could throw something in there just to kind of maybe start the, 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 the cogs turning. Do you think this decade, this coming decade has been heralded as the decade of sustainable change? We've got climate change. We've got COVID currently hitting us. So there's a couple of major changes there. Um, population growth is, 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 is accelerating, so there's some major changes happening. 
So, I mean, from a from a HS2 perspective, for the next decade, we're still building. We're not, we won't right. we won't we won't be operating. So, um, you know, that that's sort of key to the, the program. Um, yeah. Obviously, as we progress over that decade, the, the shift will change from fo- you know fully focused on the design and build to the operation ma- and maintenance of of the railway as well. But some some of the key tech that we've been exploring in terms of not so much geospatial as such, but certainly digital twin capability is with understanding the timetabling of the live and operational network. Um, HS2 is going to have some complexity where we transition to the traditional network from the high speed. Um, So then we have to factor in the network rail rolling stock as well as the uh, HS2. Um, So that's where supercomputing capability and digital twin planning um, can really lend itself to how we operate as a live network. Um, that's just one of the things. Uh, I mean, uh, Clive will probably have a, a whole suite of things. But, and I think that's because there are, you know, I've said it a few times, there are so many opportunities for applying new ways of working, um, not just in transport, but in infrastructure and construction, that um, it, it could be endless um, yes. I, would, I would suggest, you know, I've touched on ecology, um, sustainability and environment, uh, low carbon is obviously a massive thing. Uh, I don't think there are any necessary bounds to how far we could take the data and information that we collect and what we do with it, to be honest. So, um, endless. Endless. The world is ours. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just to just add to that one, um, one of the things... Um, I've been looking at in the last two or three years or so was um, we all know about kind of the introduction of drone technology and the, the level of sensors that are on them. Um, I have a, one aspect that I think, um, and this is from my uh, cursory reading so far, that is improving um, is definitely the, the number of space programs out there in terms of actually re- uh, remotely sensing information. So I think um, part of me is going to be thinking, well, are we going to have a world with drones flying around? Or actually, are we going to be using space technology with better sensors and greater resolution to help us track um, uh, changes on the ground? Um, so that's, that, that's potentially quite an ex- exciting space uh, that could be developing over the next few years uh, just to... Uh, have better cameras and sensors pointing back at the earth uh, from that point of view. So I think everybody is quite uh, realistically looking at the UAV sort of industry, but I think there is something around the remote sensing satellite world uh, where we, are, we we see more programs being uh, implemented. Uh, I think they're starting to get into discussions about um, the, the level of traffic up in space uh, and space junk and space collisions. So. Uh, for me, it feels like an exciting area. Um, yep. uh, alongside that uh, are the things that the Rob already mentioned in terms of AI and so forth, where I think um, we're very quickly shifting away from human readable to machine readable and using that supercomputing to, to, to really help us understand uh, our world uh, going forward. Yeah, thank you. And again, with that comes whole host of data not just from those you say those extra sensors whether they're on the ground or on assets whether in drones or whether in that kind of proliferation of micro satellites are being launched or yeah and ai is a huge huge and growing area the um the the european space agency actually have a a shift um space to rail program which is lends itself to the adoption of techniques and technologies from from space um, and we've we've got a project in flight with one of our contractors looking at the use of INSAR um, satellite monitoring in rural areas. So Crossrail delivered um, INSAR for urban areas for monitoring settlement. Yeah. Um, we want to do the same for uh, for the railway, for the operational railway along the rural sections of HS2. Interesting. And do you, do you see that having global application as well? So you know, there's a lot of focus on a, this specific supply chain within within you know, Central England and HS2, but you must be seeing a number of technologies coming out of your in your accelerator or potentially coming out of your supply chain which have a potential global impact for uk plc i mean is this a growth area that that we see for uk plc 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Accelerator Program is a good example of that. We've attracted international talent to that to that program, um, with the caveat that that international talent becomes housed in the UK. So, if we are we are supporting um, international business, then the, the driver behind that is that we will deliver um, additional capability to the UK supply chain um, in in those respective areas. Brilliant. Well, on on that note, on that positive note, I. I'd like to, unless we have any other questions, which I don't think we do, we cover most of them. Uh, I'd like to draw the panel session to a close. I would like to thank each and every one of the presenters on the panel and also Harry, who, who presented earlier, uh, for your, your input, your contribution. Uh, it's been an exceptionally interesting session, so thank you for that. Um, thank you for the attendees.